This is the eighth episode in a series covering the design and construction of a clock for my Relay computer. In the last episode, which was quite a while ago to be fair, I put together a breadboard prototype of my Relay clock design and got it to produce a pretty rough clock signal. Here's what I was trying to achieve. A nice steady clock signal that flips on and off, on and off. 83 milliseconds on, 83 milliseconds off, repeating the cycle every 167 milliseconds, which means that after six cycles, one second has elapsed in real time. Or in other words, a 6 hertz clock signal. This steady rhythm forms the beating heart of my computer. Everything is driven by this beat, therefore no clock, no computer. So that's the design, that's the theory. What did I actually end up creating? A bit of an abomination, to be honest. But actually, it doesn't matter. It's close enough. The actual clock signal is averaging around 6.3 Hz, which is fine, but as you can see, the peaks and troughs are very irregular. And this is mostly down to the tolerances and varying values of the resistors, capacitors and relay coils. When I build the final version of this clock, I can spend a bit more time balancing out those tolerances. But the good news is, the circuit design itself is good. And even with this wonky clock signal, the computer would still work. It'll just have a bit of an irregular beat to it. Let's call it designed in character. So, that's the clock design done, yeah? Well, actually, there's still something missing in the design, because at the moment, once the clock starts, it carries on as long as its power supplied. What we need is a bit more control, so that we can start the clock when we're ready, pause the clock, manually step the clock, very useful when debugging a program, and most importantly of all, allow the computer itself to stop the clock when the program is finished or when there's an interesting point in the program reached. Let's start with the circuit design so far. And if this diagram is new to you, it's well worth having a quick scan through the previous episodes in this series. I'll assume you've seen this before though, and that you understand how this forms a four-stage ring counter that I can use to derive a clock signal. So, I want a way to stop the clock on demand. Let's start with how I, as a user of a computer, will make that happen. That's going to need some sort of physical interface, and to that point, here's the four primary control switches. The one I'm interested in for now is the run stop switch here. When this switch is put in the run position, the clock should run, and when it's in the stop position, the clock should stop. Fantastic UI design, eh? So you might think just hooking that switch up to the clock power would do the trick. And that's certainly true for starting the clock, but you could throw the stop switch at any point during the clock cycle. Indeed, it could be here, here, here or here. See the problem? As soon as the power drops, the clock signal will drop as well, which could mean the computer receives a very, very short clock peak. Maybe so short that it leaves the computer in an indeterminate state. Did the operation the computer was doing perform correctly, uncompletely or not? unknown. This is obviously not good, and we need much more control over exactly when the clock stops. We want it to be at the end of a complete cycle, so something like here or here. So how am I going to achieve that? Well, it turns out, rather than just cut the power, we need some other way to freeze the clock at specific points. That way, when the stop switch is thrown, it powers a freeze line which will let the clock carry on running to a specific known point, but then no further. So when's the best time to freeze the clock then? When the clock is already in an off state, of course. From an outpoint point of view, that effectively just produces an exceedingly long off state, and that allows us then to manually drive the clock with the clock step switch here. Freezing the clock whilst it's in an on state, though, will produce a very long on clock signal. But then with that, the clock switch would have no effect. There's already 12 volts on the clock line, regardless of what we do with the switch. So off state it must be then. But when is the clock in the off state? Well, look at how we derive the clock's signal. When C or D is active, but not both, then the clock signal is also active. It follows therefore that the clock signal is inactive when either C and D are both active or both inactive. On the timing chart, that's the points here, here, here and here. How do we freeze the clock in those places, and only in those places then? 
Well, remember how the ring counter functions. Stage C can only come on when stage A goes off. Stage D can only come on when stage B goes off. Stage A when C goes off. And finally, stage B when D goes off. This we can see in the timing diagram. So, if we can hold stage A on, then stage C can't start. And if we can hold stage C on, D can't start either. In other words, the capacitor can't discharge on A or C because we're feeding it via the freeze line. So we just want to hook the freeze line here and here, right? Well, not quite, because we only want to accept the freeze line if stages A or C are already active. So effectively, we need to feed the freeze line back through the relay switch contacts at stage A and C. Let's make a bit of room on the diagram for that. So nothing has changed at this point. I've just budged the contacts up a bit on stage A and C. Here comes the new bits. And there we have it. Whenever the freeze line is activated and the clock reaches a point that either stage A or C is active, it'll get stuck there. When the freeze line is deactivated, the capacitor at stage A or C discharges and the clock can move on as per normal. Great, yeah? Not quite. My relays don't have three sets of contacts, they only have two. And we've been here before. This would require two relays on stage A and two relays on stage C. And this messes up the timing because now there's two relay calls in the mix with resistance in parallel and that requires changes to the RC network that ultimately defines the timing. In fact, in a previous video in this series, you may have seen that not only did it mess up the timing, but I also started getting all sorts of oddities going on. So, three sets of contacts, two relays, not happening. So, what else can I do? Well, let's go back to my original diagram. We only want to let the freeze line through to relay A when it's active, and only through to relay C when it's active. Hmm. OK, well, let's make a bit of space in the diagram, as I think I've got an idea that might work. So all I've done is just squish the contact sets down in relay C and D down a bit. It's otherwise functionally unchanged from before. So how about I add two additional relays like so? And connect them, as before, to the relay calls of A and C respectively, like so. Cool. Now I just need to switch the relays on when the respective stages are on. For stage A, that's pretty straightforward. I can take it from the A output here. That's nice and clean, and I know the only thing hanging off the A output is going to be an LED. It's not used for anything else, so there's no risk of any backfeed. Let's do the same for C. Does that work? Well, it does if you treat this circuit in isolation, but what I can't vouch for is what's on the other end of the clock circuit. So it makes sense to pop a diode on this output, just to make sure the traffic's all one way. This does of course introduce a voltage drop, but for the 4148s I use, that's around 0.7 volts, so not a massive concern. Right, so that brings us to the following design. Now my only concern with this design, well, design hack actually, is that there's now six relays that are going to be put under considerable strain, given how often they'll be turning on and off. As such, I've been mounting these in sockets rather than soldering directly to the PCB, so that I can switch them out more easily. It's a shame the two additional relays are operating regardless of whether they're needed or not, um, but the workaround will be to introduce an additional relay that only feeds the A and C outputs through when the freeze line is active. Effectively, it'll interrupt the lines here and here. I'll probably add that to the final design so that I'm not aging those additional relays unnecessarily. So we're just about there, I think. Well, almost. Promise. Um, remember I said earlier that I also want the computer to be able to operate the freeze line at the end of the program, or when it gets to an interesting point in that program. To do this, I'll need a special halt instruction, which will ask the computer to operate the control line of the same name. That in turn will need to operate the freeze line and keep it on. But before we look at that, though, let's simplify our diagram a bit. So now I've represented everything you've seen so far as a single functional block. The circuit within it is identical to what you've seen so far. The inputs are the main clock power, marked V, and the freeze line, marked F. The outputs, along the bottom, A, B, C and D, relate to the clock stages. And finally, the main event at the right, the outbound clock signal, marked CLK. Let's have some LEDs for those outputs because, well, 
Everyone likes blink and lights. Next, let's bring in those primary switches. We've already discussed the run-stop switch, and it'll operate the freeze line via a diode. The clock step switch we've also talked about. This is a momentary switch and will drive the clock line directly. What we want to avoid though is the clock step switch being used whilst the clock is running. That's an easy one to fix. Now we only provide power to the clock step switch when the clock is off. Simples. So now we get to the halt line. We want to operate the freeze line when the halt line is operated. OK, that's a basic relay. But remember I said we want the freeze line to latch on when the halt line is operated. Again, fairly straightforward. We just feed the voltage line through one of the relay contact sets and that will lock the relay on. So that's great, we've got our halt functionality, but what we can't do is restart the clock again. We'd have to turn the power off and, of course, that'll wipe our program from memory. Not very useful. The fix is pretty simple. We just need to interrupt the feed to the relay coil like so. The restart switch, marked here as RSRT, is also momentary, so we'll always return to the off position. And with it wired out this way, we can break the feed to the relay coil. Operating the reset switch will de-energise the relay coil and drop the freeze line, allowing the computer to resume its heartbeat. Assuming the program counter is pointing to just after the previous halt instruction, the computer will continue executing the program from there. And that's it. That's the full design of the relay computer's relay clock. In the next episode, I'll add this to the breadboard prototype and make sure it all works. See you next time.